We are finishing up our summer series on the first few books of Acts today. We are in Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 40. And uh, next week, we start our sermon series uh, that's going to lead us through the end of the year in the book of Hebrews. Hey, if you don't have a Bible, uh, this morning is going to be a whole lot more enjoyable and accessible to you if you grab one of these blue hardback Bibles. They're all throughout the room. They are yours for the taking. If you don't have a Bible at home, please take it as our gift to you. Turn to page 1089 in those blue Bibles if you need a page number. We're looking at Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 40. And uh, I owe a lot of the uh, sermon in the inside I got this morning from Dr. Michael Kuhn, who's one of our supported missionaries. And uh, we're going to get to hear from Michael Kuhn in October, but I want to give him a shout out and an acknowledgement for opening up this passage to me in a new way at our General Assembly this past summer. Uh, So with that in mind, though, friends, let's look at Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 40. Friends, hear the word of the Lord to us. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went, and there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, And he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And so he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here's water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. And the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Friends, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God remains forever. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Would you keep that Bible open as we pray together now? Father, we love you this morning, and we thank you for the good news of the gospel. Lord, we pray that our hearts would be open to it in a new and a fresh way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Do you think the gospel is good news? I think a lot of times people forget the gospel is good news. You know, I don't know if this image makes sense to you, but, you know, our fallen world and our fallen natures are such that I really picture my heart is kind of like hard soil. You know, do you garden? Have you ever like come across hard soil? And like every day I have to sort of take some tools and like burrow the gospel seeds down into my hard heart. (laughs) Because every night when I go to sleep, my hard heart sort of pushes out the grace of God and I wake up a sinner all over again. And I've got to continually beat the grace and the goodness of God into my heart. Because my natural heart is here to just to forget about it and to push it out. Uh, Well, friend, I wanna encourage you to look down at Acts chapter eight this morning and If nothing else, my heart's desire for you this morning is to see the glory and the beauty and the grace and the goodness of Jesus Christ this morning. So I don't know why you came to church this morning, but you're gonna hear a lot about Jesus and how great he is this morning. And if you're a Christian, I could not say anything more exciting than what I just said. Look at Acts chapter eight, verse 26. Uh, We're finishing up our section on the early church, Acts 1 through 8. And what happens? Look at verse 26. Now, an angel of the Lord said to Philip. Now, pause right there. There is an apostle named Philip, but this is Philip the deacon. 
So if you remember from a few weeks ago, we are introduced to some deacons. So now Philip is told by the Lord to rise and go to the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Now you've probably heard of the Gaza Strip that's still a part of uh, uh, Israel to this day, right? And if you sort of focus on, uh, if you could imagine like a map of Israel, there's Jerusalem, the capital, right? And then down to the south, there's Gaza. And so the reason he's being sent there uh, is presumably because the Holy Spirit has a plan for him but you may remember from the book of Acts, Jesus says that the apostles and his people are going to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. And so last week, if you were here, we talked about the gospel going to Samaria. And now we're seeing the gospel going to the regions of Judea, including all the way down to Gaza. And now you and I are gonna be introduced to a man who was from the land of Cush, or what we might call Ethiopia. He's an African, so his skin would have been black. And what's fascinating is he represents for many Israelites what they would have deemed the ends of the earth. It's the exotic Timbuktu, the strange world, Xanadu, right? Whatever you wanna call it, right? The Ethiopians were the ends of the earth to many of the Israelites. And so what we're seeing is the gospel, according to Acts, has gone from Jerusalem on Pentecost. It's now gone into Samaria, and now it's reaching the edges of Judea and all the borders of Israel. And now it's starting to go to the ends of the earth. And you and I are introduced to the first black man that comes to faith in Jesus Christ, the Ethiopian eunuch. As early as the church exists, it is for all people from every ethnic group. Isn't that beautiful? It's right here in Acts chapter eight, verse 26. Now, of course, Luke tells us this is a desert place, so Philip is not going on vacation here. That's the point of that, right? Uh, This is a strange place. Philip doesn't exactly know why he has to go down to a desert place, but look what he does. Philip obeys. So he rose and he went and he obeyed the angel, and there he meets an Ethiopian man, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, and this man was in charge of all of her treasure. Now, an Ethiopian man, of course, he's an African man. A eunuch would have referred, uh, unfortunately, in the ancient world, men uh, oftentimes were, uh, they had their genitals mutilated. They were either cut off completely in many ways or they were crushed. But a eunuch was a man who had had his genitals mutilated. And probably the reason why this man had had his genitals mutilated like this was because he was a slave. And he worked for the queen. Her, Her title is called Candace. That's not her first name. Uh, that's her title. You know how like Pharaoh is, not, is, is a person, but it's also a title or like Caesar. It's like, well, which Caesar or which Herod? There's a bunch of them. Well, Candace was the, just the title for the queen of Ethiopia, the queen of Cush, if you will. And this man is a eunuch. And if you're a eunuch, that means you'll never have what? It means you'll never have children and you'll never be married, probably. Never married, definitely you're never having kids. In the ancient world, what do you think was more important to people, money or kids? Uh, It was their name, right? The name, my name will continue. You know, if you read the Old Testament laws, if a guy dies, his brother is supposed to have a son on his behalf so that his original name would continue, this man's name will be cut off when he dies. He has no hope for a future. He's a eunuch, he's an Ethiopian. But look what verse 27 says. But he had come to Jerusalem to worship. And he was returning. He was going back to the land of Cush. He was going back to Ethiopia, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Now, what's especially fascinating about this is we start to see that this man had some wealth. He had presumably like what you and I might consider a good job in the ancient world because he has enough money to acquire a scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And he's educated enough that he can read it. Uh, We we aren't told if it's a Hebrew scroll, but I tend to think this is a Greek translation of Isaiah based on the passage that is quoted right here. But either way, he's an educated man. Uh, He may think of it as injustice, but on the other side, he has a pretty good job. He works for, goodness, the queen of Ethiopia. And he can travel. He can go celebrate uh, whoever he worships. He can go to Jerusalem. But what's interesting about him going to Jerusalem, look down at verse 27. It says, where where did he go to worship? What city does he go to worship? He goes to Jerusalem. Okay, so the Bible scholars in the room, if you were an African, do you think you would stick out in Israel? 
you would stick out. You would not have been circumcised. You probably were not Jewish. Everybody could probably tell that immediately. Bible scholars, if you're a eunuch and you're not a Jew and you wanna go worship the one true God because the gods of Cush are nothing and you want to know the true God of the world, you go to Jerusalem. And when you go to Jerusalem, if you're a eunuch, can you enter the temple? Deuteronomy 23, verse one, let no male whose genitals are crushed or cut off enter the assembly of the Lord. So this man wants to know God. This man has been the victim of injustice. He's a slave. He has been mutilated and crushed. He'll never have kids. And yet he wants to know God and he goes to Jerusalem to worship. He doesn't get to go into the temple, but he's there. He's as close as he can get. Verse 28, and as he was going back to his home, seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And then look what Luke tells us. And the spirit, who's that? The Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit says to Philip, go over there and grab a hold of this chariot. <laughs> Remember, the angel had said, go out into the wilderness, you know, go into the middle of nowhere, you know, go out to Merlin, you'll meet somebody, right? I apologize if you're from Merlin. I've never been there. I've heard it's nice. All right. You could imagine why he would maybe be surprised at seeing this very wealthy chariot with an African man. Oh, and, and in the ancient world, you read out loud, just FYI. So that's, you know, he's probably reading it out loud. And so Philip runs up, verse 30. So Philip ran to him, heard him reading the prophet Isaiah, right? Because he's reading it out loud. And Philip comes up and he asks a great question. Do you understand what you're reading? But I want you to notice first, uh, the first thing I want you to notice about this story is in verse 29. I need you to see the Holy Spirit's love of this man. And the Spirit said to Philip, get over there. There's one man in a chariot out in the middle of nowhere. And he is trying to understand God and you are to go tell him. Acts is so beautiful. We get stories in Acts where thousands of people come to faith in a day and it's glorious. But you know what else is glorious? When one person meets the living God and the Holy Spirit knows who this man is. And he says, Philip, get over there, grab the chariot, stop. And you'll know what to say. Do you see the Holy Spirit's care for this man? Do you see the Holy Spirit's love for the Gentiles, for the peoples of this world? So what are we supposed to see next? Look at verse 30. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked him, do you understand what you're reading? <laughs> the, the implication in that question in the Greek is, you don't understand what you're reading, do you? <laughs> and the man said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this. This is from Isaiah 53. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter and like a lamb before its shears is silent. So he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation for his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or someone else? Now, what I want you to see in verses 30 through 33, the first thing I want you to notice is the way that you and I come to know God, the way that you and I know the true God is through scripture. How do you know who God is? Christian, how do you know who God is? you know him through his revealed word, 
That's how we know who God is. He has spoken to us. If you want to hear his voice, you can open up his scriptures. That's how you and I come to know the God of Israel, the God who made you. You can hear his voice today. You're hearing it right now. How do you and I know God? We have the word of God. But notice what we see in this story. Philip says, do you understand this book? (laughs) Now, of course, he doesn't have a book. He has one scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And how does the man respond? How does the eunuch respond? He says, well, how am I supposed to understand unless someone guides me? And this is such a profound realization, friend, if you can see it. We know God through the scriptures. We know him through his word that he has given to us. But God also chooses to commission us his church, to tell other people about the word of God. You, Christian, are commissioned. You are empowered by the Holy Spirit. You are called by your Savior to share the word of God with the people who are desperately in need of the grace and the healing of Jesus Christ. Friends, you can do this by A basic way would be to invite somebody to do the word one-to-one. We've offered several trainings on that, and we would love for every member of our church at least once to agree to read the Gospel of John with someone who's not a Christian. Just do it once in your life. Um, You know, chances are, if you ask three people, two of them are going to say no, and one of them will say yes. But you know what? If that's your batting average, buddy, you're an all-star. If you bat 333, that's pretty good. What might happen if you shared the gospel with somebody? We are called, like Philip, to explain. Here's what's going on in Isaiah. Can I tell you about Jesus? We have the revealed word of God, and we are the body of Christ. We are his mouth in this world telling people about Jesus. But here's the thing. Um, I can talk till I'm blue in the face, and most of you are never going to do that. Most Christians live their whole lives, and they never lead anybody to the Lord. They never tell anybody Um, So I don't don't say that to, you know, I don't know, shame you. Um, I want you to step back and I want you to think for just a second about why that's the case. Why don't we tell people about Jesus? And here's what I think. This is just my opinion. I think it's because we don't really believe the gospel's good news for people. I think we believe that there are other things that are more important than life And we just don't trust in the goodness of God. We think, oh, our friends, you know, they have such a different lifestyle. They have different morals. If I I tell them about Jesus, they're just gonna be mad at me and angry. And it may not even make their life better because you know what? I'm not all that happy anyway following Jesus and I've got my doubts. So why would I burden them with my burden? I don't think Christians today are convinced enough of the goodness of Jesus. Uh, This past week in The Atlantic, I read an interesting article by Jake Metters called The Misunderstood Reason Millions of Americans Stopped Going to Church. And uh, he's talking about why Christians have maybe lost the sense of not just church, but like why Christianity itself matters. Uh, He goes on, he says, you know, um, the book suggests that the defining problem uh, driving out most people who leave church is just how American life works in the 21st century. Contemporary America simply isn't set up to promote mutuality, care, or common life. Rather, it is designed, and this is why I think people lose the gospel. Contemporary American life, the life that you woke up to today, the things you're thinking about this week, those things are designed to maximize individual accomplishment as defined by professional and financial success. Such a system leaves precious little time or energy for forms of community that don't contribute to one's own professional life, or as one argues, the professional prospects of one's children. Workism, that is living for the sake of work, reigns in America, and because of it, community in America, religious community included, is simply a math problem that doesn't add up. What he's getting at is I think Christians, we don't, Remember the goodness of God. We're not convinced 
that God is as beautiful as the gospel says he is. Instead, we worship work and we worship financial success. They are our gods. We bow down to them and we teach our kids to bow down to them. Think of the Ethiopian eunuch. He has, on some level, a great job. He works for the queen. He can go wherever he wants. He can buy the scroll of Isaiah. He has financial success. And he's got a great job. Outwardly, he is successful. Inwardly, there is a crater in his soul. Yes, he has a great job. And yes, he has money. But guess what? He's also a slave. Why is the gospel good news? The next thing I need you to see is I need you to understand the story and the meaning of this eunuch. Think about it this way. This eunuch, in a sense, is a powerful man, right? He can buy, he can travel, he's got a good job, he's got financial success, he has a profession. And yet, all of those things, money, success, the gods of his own people, uh, it's like ocean water. It can't actually satisfy the thirst in his soul because he's got to go to Jerusalem. And even they won't even let him into the temple, but at least that's something real. And those false gods, it's like ocean water, right? And if you have a wound, you can't put ocean water on the wound, it'll burn. So what does he do? He goes to the wells of salvation in Israel. He goes to the one true God, but he's not allowed into the temple. It's because he's a eunuch. And although he has a great job, he really doesn't have control over his life. He is controlled by money and he is controlled by his boss. So as you think about this man, can you picture him in your mind's eye? Can you do that for just a second? Try to picture an ancient African man sitting in a chariot, castrated, working. At a profound level, he is humiliated by his status as a eunuch. He's the victim of injustice. He is quite literally oppressed by the viciousness of our world. You take a man like that, broken by this world, cut off, no future, no name. Sure, he can live for the gods of wealth and work, but those are never gonna satisfy. You take a man like that, a man not unlike many people today, and of everything in the book of Isaiah, all of the amazing verses in Isaiah. What is he reading? Look at what he's reading. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb before its shearer is silent. Those are cutting images of an innocent man being led to a slaughter and being cut but he opens not his mouth. In this man's humiliation, justice was denied him. This man is the victim of injustice. He's humiliated. He's been cut. Who can describe his generation? That word generation right there, if you read the NIV, is also translated posterity, descendants. You might translate this as, where's his family? For his life is taken away from the earth. This man has no everlasting name. Where's his family? And what does the eunuch ask? Who is he talking about? Because the eunuch is wondering, is Isaiah like me? Will this suffering servant be like me? Is there someone who has also experienced injustice? What is this passage about? Verse 35, Philip opened his mouth. That's Bible for I'm speaking on behalf of God right now. Of course he opens his mouth. 
The point is, he's going to speak on behalf of God. And beginning with this scripture, he told him what? Buddy, I have the greatest news you will ever hear. And beginning with this scroll, he tells him about Jesus. Flip over in your Bible to page 729. Go to Isaiah 53. I don't know why you're here this morning, but I'm hoping it's to learn about the greatness and the glory of Jesus Christ. Isaiah is an Old Testament prophet for seeing the day that the Messiah would one day come and redeem our vicious world. Pastor Richard already quoted from Isaiah 53 this morning. So if you start in verse three, page 729, Isaiah 53, three, we learn this about the Messiah. Remember the eunuch is saying, what is this story telling me about? It says, this man was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. But surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And then look at verse 10. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. But when his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. And out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. And by his knowledge shall the righteous one, the Messiah, my servant, make many to be accounted righteousness. And he will bear their iniquities." Friends, what Philip tells this eunuch is the gospel, that the solution to the viciousness and the sin and the fallenness of our world is such that God entered our world. He became the victim of injustice. In his humiliation, justice was denied Christ. He died on a cross, not because any deceit was found in his mouth, but so that he could bear the punishment of our sins, so that he could take the brunt of the chastisement and the punishment that you and I deserve, and so does this world deserve. And he takes it upon himself and he gives it as an offering, a guilt offering for this broken world. He dies for our sin. And he's raised to new life and he prolongs his days. He somehow dies and yet has many offspring. Even though all of us have gone astray, even though all of us have sinned, God laid on Jesus the iniquity of us all. There is salvation. Friends, the goodness of the gospel is that Jesus loves this broken world so much that he came to die for it. He came to die for broken people like you and broken people like this eunuch. That is the good news of the gospel. Verse 36, and as they were going along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? You know, if you read Acts chapter two, what must I do to be saved? Repent and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So what happens? Uh, he commands the chariot to stop, verse 39. And Philip and this man both go down into the water. Can you picture it in your mind? Philip and the eunuch and Philip baptizes them right there. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, we're gonna get to see a baptism next week. Someone professing faith in Jesus. He gets baptized probably immersed, but not totally sure. But I think he was probably immersed three times, honestly. Then to finish up, look at verse 39. When they came up out of the water, who appears? Who's behind all of this? This Holy Spirit who loves this man. The Holy Spirit who loves you. And he whisks him away. 
Now, Philip goes off to Azotus and other communities telling people about Jesus because he's convinced of the goodness of God. But it's interesting because it says that the eunuch goes away rejoicing. Do you see that? The eunuch leaves and goes back home, presumably rejoicing. Now, pause for just a second. Why is he rejoicing? He's heard about Jesus. He knows he's going to heaven. But has Philip healed him? Has he had a physical healing? No. Will this man ever have kids? Is that what's always promised, that every physical problem is going to be healed? No. What happens is he's rejoicing for a different reason than simply physical healing in his life. He's still a eunuch. He's still castrated. So why is he rejoicing? I think he's rejoicing because he has Isaiah on the journey back. Go back to Isaiah. Turn to page 730. We don't have time to read all of Isaiah 54 through 56, but I wish we did. After this section about Jesus taking the punishment for our sins, how do people respond to the message of Jesus? What does Isaiah call us to do? Look at Isaiah 54. Sing, O barren one who did not have kids. Break forth into singing and cry aloud. Make a bigger tent. God is going to give you a huge family. Look at verse five. For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. And the Holy One of Israel is your redeemer. The God of the whole earth, he is called. And then look at Isaiah 55, verse one. Come everyone who thirsts, every Ethiopian, who knows the gods of Cush will never satisfy. Come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters and he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? And why do you spend your labor on that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. And I will make with you an everlasting covenant. Why slave for the gods of work and financial success? Why do you labor for that which does not satisfy? And look at Isaiah 55, verse 12. For you shall go out in joy and be led in peace. And the mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing. And all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up a myrtle tree. And it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Thus says the Lord, keep justice and do righteousness. For soon my salvation will come and my righteousness will be revealed. Blessed is the man who does this and the son of man who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath not profaning it and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. And let not the eunuch say, behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbath, who choose the things that please me and hold fast to my covenant, I will give you in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants. Everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in the house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar for my house shall be a house of prayer for all peoples. The Lord God, who gathers the outcasts of Israel declares, I will gather yet others besides those already gathered. Let not the eunuch say, behold, I am nothing. I give him something better than sons and daughters. I give him a monument and an everlasting name. No longer will he not be allowed in the temple. He will come for my house shall be a house of prayer. For all nations. Friends, this is an invitation to see the goodness of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that one day we will feast in the house of Zion, 
that you promise that on that mountain you will remove the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over the nations, and you will swallow up death forever. And you, Lord, will wipe away every tear from our eyes, and you will remove the reproach, for you have spoken. Lord, we pray, behold, you are our God. We have waited for you, and you have saved us. You are the Lord. Let us be glad and rejoice in your salvation. Father, as we make this journey towards that holy city to Zion, we think of those who have already entered it by your grace. Lord, this week we remember and commend to you Joan Johnson, who passed away this week. Lord, have mercy on her family. And Lord, we know that she is rejoicing seeing you face to face, even now in the holy city of Zion. Lord, we pray for those who are struggling in this world in need of your healing. Father, we pray for Mary Mitchell, Corinne Jennings, Paula McCauley, Dick Card, Kristen Tours, and Colleen Eccleston. God, have mercy on each one of them. Lord, this week we pray for another Valley Church and we lift to you Table Rock Fellowship. And Lord, I praise and thank you that they have a new pastor. And Lord, I pray that his pastorate would be blessed by your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we would hear of many great things through that church. Lord, that many would be accounted righteous as they proclaim the gospel. Lord, we pray for Pacific Bible College. Lord, you be with those teachers, the administrators in their new campus. And Lord, would they allow their students and empower them to be guides, to tell people about your word. And Lord, we pray for the Philemon Project this morning, that beautiful ministry in Lebanon, God, be with them and empower them for ministry. Lord, as they minister to people who are broken by this vicious world, would they see Jesus broken for them? In his name we pray, amen.